Welcome to our broadcast tonight from the nation's capital for an exclusive conversation with one of the important people in the world today. Yitzhak Rabin, the Prime Minister of Israel, is one of the two people who holds the future of the Israeli PLO peace accord in his hands. The other, of course, is Yasser Arafat, chairman of the PLO. Mr. Rabin has been the Israeli Army's chief of staff. He's been United States ambassador. He's been defense minister and prime minister before his re-election to the highest office in the land after almost 20 years. It is fair to say that he has faced many diplomatic and military crises and challenges that the events of the last six months certainly count high among them. In early September, he signed a peace accord with the PLO. On February 25th, a Jewish settler opened fire at a mosque in Hebron, killing at least 30 Palestinians, putting the already shaky peace agreement in jeopardy. That day, President Clinton asked Mr. Rabin and Mr. Arafat to come back to the negotiating table in the United States. Can this peace process get back on track? Joining us now, the Prime Minister of the State of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin. Welcome, sir. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's been a very, very long day for you, and uh, I thank you for, for being here with us. I, I want to start with the sense of, of history. Uh, someone who follows you says that they have the sense that history came and grabbed you and said, um, there is your moment. Do you feel that, that somehow history has put you in a special place and that, that you are uh, at a moment in your life that challenges the best in you? Well, I don't pretend to describe my, my position at this stage in the way that you did. Uh, it's true. I'm quite an uh, uh, old guy. <laughs> Some would say 70 at the, beginning, is not. at the beginning of this month, I became 72 years old. I was born in Jerusalem. I grew up there. Most of my life was spent there. And it happened that I, as an Israeli, as a Jew, was born to the most unique historic period in the life of the Jewish people in the last 2,000 years. I belong to the generation that even though I lived in Palestine, where I was born, uh, during the period of the Holocaust, during the Second World War, it was the most tragic event in the 2000 years of Jewish history after the destruction of the Second Temple. I belong to the generation that as a result of the tragedy and what was done by the Jewish people in a limited way in the land of Israel, then British Mandatory Palestine, had the opportunity to have the fate of the Jewish people in its hands. And therefore I was part of the struggle against the British for the creation of the Jewish state and participated in the longest and the bloodiest war that Israel has ever experienced till this moment, our war of independence. And therefore I feel that on one hand, I'm really privileged to belong to the generation of Jews that can, could and can take the fate of their own people in their hands. On the other hand, I'm fully aware of the unique responsibility that my generation, no doubt a person in the position that I uh, holds now as a Prime Minister of Israel. I believe that uh, we today face a unique window of opportunities. The kind of unique window of opportunities that our founding father, the first Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, faced at the end of the Second World War, as a result of the Holocaust, 
as a result of the kind of the Second World War was. The war really between evil and right. Mm -hmm. And he understood then that this is the period in which if we will not achieve a statehood, even in part of former British Palestine, part of the land of Israel, as a Jewish state, we might miss the historic moment. To create, Today, a state, to create the state of Israel. To create, to get the recognition by the international community as it was in the Declaration of the United Nations Secure, uh, Council, uh, United Nations Assembly on the 29th of November 1947. But at the same time to know that the declaration of the international uh, community will remain piece of paper if we will not be able to withstand the war of independence, the war between Israel and the Palestinians and the six, seven Arab countries that invaded then Palestine with the declared goal to destroy the United Nations partition plan and to push us into the sea. This was the most historic moment in the last 100 years of Jewish history beyond the Holocaust. And today I feel that there is a coincidence of events, the collapse of the Soviet Empire, the bankruptcy of communism, the end of the Cold War, the crisis in the Gulf where the United States stood firm and made it clear that aggression will never pay. And I believe that this is a unique period in which at least I feel that we must give peace a chance. We took risks at war. I'll never forget what happened prior to the Six Day War when we presented to the cabinet I was then the chief of staff of the armed forces. How we'll finish the Air Force of Egypt. Out of 200 fighters, we sent 188 in three waves to destroy once forever the Egyptian Air Force. We left 12 planes to protect all the skies of Israel against the Syrian, the Jordanian, and the Iraqi Air Forces. We said it's a calculated risk. Without taking then this risk, the war that is called the Six Day War would not be ended in six days and would not, be, would not achieve the kind of achievements that we succeeded. And so you say to the Israeli people in 1994, we have to take the same kind of risk. Now, I say to the Israelis, we have great opportunities, but at the same time, many dangers. We have to take calculated risk for peace, not only risks at war. I believe that without trying to change the realities, and realities between the Arab countries, the Arab peoples, and Israel cannot be changed without putting them into a test. No one can say for sure that everything is in the pocket, that whenever an Arab leader signs a paper, he will keep, or his regime might be undermined, and a new regime can come. To what extent can be assured that agreement with an Arab country regime will be kept by another regime that uh, will get rid of the former one, regardless to that. And as, uh, if I may add, we have an experience. Next week, in, on the 26th of March, we will celebrate the 15th anniversary of the signing of the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. The mere fact that for 15 years, not only peace was achieved, maintained, passed tests, 
It might be not the warm, it might not be the warmest piece, but I've learned the hard way. It's a better a cold piece than so-called good war. When you heard, where were you when you heard the news of what had happened at Hebron? Uh, I was uh, at my official residence in Jerusalem, the Prime Minister residence. I believe it was uh, about six o'clock in the morning. Then the Chief of Staff of the Armed Forces, General Barak, phoned me and told me the story. At the beginning, it was uh, not very clear. He said that an Israeli armed person opened fire on innocent uh, Muslims praying on Friday, uh, the holy months of Ramadan, in a holy place to Muslims and Jews alike. Uh, the first information was that 10 uh, Palestinians were killed and I understood immediately that we would face a real terrible story. What did you think you had to do? First, to find out the facts. Second, to make sure that the inflammation of such a tragic event will not really bring about total collapse of whatever we have tried to build in very long period in the negotiation with the Palestinians, in the negotiations with the other Arab countries. But I tell you quite frankly, also, and might be with great uh, concern or deep concern, I feared about the disruption of the delicate uh, fabric of relations between Israeli Arabs, Palestinians, and uh, the Israeli Jews. Today, the population of Israel is five, over 5.3 million Israeli citizens, out of which almost a million are non-Jews. They are fully-fledged Israelis with all the civilian and political rights. I'm not talking about the Palestinians who are the residents of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And after 46 years of living together in Israel, Jews and Arabs alike, as Israeli citizens, to see a, a situation in which this fabric of relations that has been so much cultivated will be, be torn to pieces brought a great uh, fears to my mind. There were three days mourning and demonstration, and I am glad that at least within Israel, between the, Israel, the Jewish and the Arab Israelis, the situation has been calmed and returned almost to normal. Yet you have witnessed a man who has received the trust of the people to look out for their security. You have listened and watched people call you a traitor. For, oh, for what? Uh, for the last, since uh, I decided to make a very, very painful decision, but a necessary one. Necessary. Necessary, without which. I didn't believe there would be a chance to solve the 100 years long conflict. A terrible, terrible conflict between Palestinians and Jews at the beginning, Palestinians and Israel in what used to be under the British mandated uh, Palestine. Uh, I remember it vividly. 
when I was a kid, the struggle. I remember the riots of 97, 19, uh, 27, mm. 29, 36, 39, and of course, uh, the war of independence. I felt that we have to do it. What do you say to Chairman Arafat? You had phone conversations with him. I didn't have... None? Uh, no conversation uh, with him? When we met uh, in the White House before... Oh, you said the tonight. Ceremony, you the said ce before the ceremony on the lawn, we didn't exchange words. Till we remain only the three of us, President Clinton, Chairman Arafat, and myself. And we looked at the ceremony. I turned to him, to Mr. Arafat. He said, it's going to be very difficult. He says, I know, it's going to be very difficult. I knew that there would be ups and downs. I knew that among the Palestinians, there are those who oppose it and will use indiscriminate terror. The Islamic extremists like the Hamas, the Islamic Jihad, to a lesser extent because of their lack of capability, the 10 rejectionist Palestinian organizations, that their headquarters are in, the, in Syria. And uh, President Assad doesn't interfere whatsoever in their activities against the agreement. But I expected opposition on the part of Israel, of Israelis. 50,000 Israelis demonstrated against me. They called me traitor. They put me with Arafat yeah. Kefir. Yes. They burned my pictures. I'm not saying that it was pleasant, but I didn't mind. Because? Because I believe that what, we, what I'm doing is the right thing to do. And I believe that whoever wants really to change realities will face antagonism on the most conservative way of thinking, uh, approaching to the problem. And no doubt, with those uh, false messianic uh, religious perceptions, that everything was given to God, only God decides. There's no problem to believe in God, but to, ex to assume that if, since you believe in God, there, you have no responsibility in a democracy to the laws of the democracy and to accept the fact that the government in a democracy is elected by the people. What do you do now for this peace accord that you believe is so precious and an opportunity and the same opportunity that Ben Gurion did? What do you do to get Arafat back on track? Well, no doubt that the tragedy in Hebron uh, affected not only the Israelis, but first and foremost, the Palestinians. And no doubt it was a setback to Arafat among his own people. You have some sympathy for the position he's been placed in. And I believe that when you see such a murderous atrocity carried out by a Jew who pretends to be religious are more than shameful. More than shameful. But it is a stain on, the, on, the, on Judaism. But at the same time, I had to cope with such, not exactly. Uh, the problem of organization like the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad coming up declaring and instigating killing and 33 Israelis were killed since the 13th yeah. of September 93 when we signed the DOP. 
But what I did say to the people, even though 50,000 demonstrated against me, I said, we'll fight terrorism on one hand, we'll continue negotiations on the other hand. Because the real solution to the problem is the political arena, without giving up to terrorism. Especially terrorism, that its purpose is not just to kill Israelis, but beyond it and above it, to this to kill the peace process. At the same time, I expect Chairman Arafat, with all the difficulties that are laying ahead of his way, he has to overcome the same way. I didn't ask him to do what I have done as a prime minister. When we on Sunday outlawed the Kahana disciples, Kah, Kahana Chai, all this, this your, your language disruption. was you spit them out. Yeah, exactly. And I didn't ask Arafat to do anything similar, not by power, but at least by words, vis-a-vis -vis the Hamas, vis-a-vis -vis the Islamic Jihad. He has never came out against them all the way publicly. He did not condemn and them. And you didn't do it for what reason? Because you felt like? I believe that Israel, as a Jewish state, has to live by different norms. Norms of behavior, of morality, of what should be done and should not be done. For us, even in fighting, a few years ago, yeah. terrorists crossed the border in Lebanon. Paratroopers patrol went there. They opened fire, they killed two soldiers. The soldiers opened fire, and one of the terrorists, I believe it was the one that killed the two soldiers, raised his hands. The paratroopers didn't fire at him. Once he raised his hand, gave in. It's not a fighting, it's a murder. This is the line that, that we taught, educated our people to realize. I would like Israel to be a country living in its armed forces with its own population by the kind of norms of behavior in fighting and not in fighting, but especially in fighting, to distinguish between fighting and murdering. And you had to draw that line. No doubt. And I believe it's essential to protect our democracy. Is it a, can you imagine circumstances in which you would open up the accord and consider Jerusalem on the table, consider settlements on the table, consider UN peacekeeping forces uh, with weapons in the settlements? Can you imagine that? as an incentive for Arafat to come to Washington and keep the peace The accord. answer is clear, no. And why? All the issues that you were mentioned are included in the DOP in a program. Declaration of Principles? Or? The Declaration of Principles that was signed in Washington. Settlements, Jerusalem, borders, refugees, it is written very clearly, our issues to be left nego to negotiate only when we negotiate a permanent solution. Any opening, reopening, of an agreement that was signed six months ago, like the Declaration of Principle, or six weeks ago, the Cairo Agreement will put a big question mark on next agreements. What's the purpose? To reach a few, uh, the next agreement if every agreement that was signed within the last six months can be reopened. I believe the only way 
And I said it on the phone when I talked a week ago, or something of this kind, to Chairman Arafat. I said, you have got enemies of peace, I have got enemies of peace. It will hold negotiation as a result of atrocity by the enemies of peace on both sides. And they will achieve their goal. This will be a prize for atrocity, and even more so. If uh, bo on both sides, those who oppose peace will realize that as a result of a real terror, terrible uh, event, they can bring about hold to the peace. It will serve as incentive to them to increase their efforts and to bring it about. Because their main purpose, the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, believe me, this lunatic uh, murderer from Kiryat Arba, the Jewish one. Yes. He was a Jewish Hamas. He was a Jewish Hamas. Yeah. He was an extremist just way the Hamas the is. The Hamas. Yeah. For me, it is at the same level. This kind of people will see if we carry this kind of atrocities, it holds the negotiations. If it holds the negotiations, this is our political goal. Let's increase our activities. The best answer to them is to prove that on both sides the leadership is determined, knowing the difficulties. What did Chairman to, Go ahead. To accelerate the negotiation, to reach an agreement, to implement. I believe we were on the verge of reaching agreement of the Gaza Jericho first. In three to five weeks, we could achieve it. In five plus minus weeks, we could implement to go out of the Gaza, accept the settlements or whatever was agreed. To go out of our forces from the area of Jericho. It's not a long, prolonged uh, uh, process. Uh, in, the DOP, uh, in the Declaration of Principle, four months are given to that. I can do it between five to six weeks, once an agreement will be reached. What did Chairman Arafat respond? What did he say? He didn't say very clearly. Yeah. He wants uh, to achieve something. To I'm, I'm not trying at this stage to say anything about uh, personalities, etc. I'm talking about what we have to do. And where history is. And where where the solution is, and where is the answer to the enemies of peace on both sides. What, what about bringing settlers out of Hebron? Can you, could you accept that? Uh, not at this stage. Not at this stage. I'm not saying what will happen once we'll have a, a permanent solution. Even from the municipal point of view, uh, the city of Hebron today uh, is populated by about 100,000 Palestinians, 415 Israelis. Mm. I believe the figures speak for, for themselves. Tell me what you think about the UN vote the resolution is to come? Well, uh, there is no yet a resolution by the UN. Uh, many years ago, when I was Chief of Staff of the Armed Forces of Israel, I invited our ambassador to the UN to explain to the General Staff, to the command, various commanders of the IDF, uh, what's going on in the UN? And our ambassador then said, to put to you, he started by saying, to put to you our position, Israel's position, in the UN, I will use military terms. It's a kind of a battlefield that we can never win. The question, how badly we are losing there. This is our attitude 
even towards the UN, even though in the last year or two there was an improvement in the international right. relations of uh, Israel. There are many more countries that have recognized. We have developed relations with countries that in the past mm. no one could uh, dream that we would have. I'm not going to argue now what should be the position of one country or another about uh, the proposed resolution. I believe the issue is not what kind of resolution will pass in the UN, but to what extent the UN, in addition to the United States, not as an organization, as country, uh, as member countries, will assist to bring back the negotiations on track. Old enemies have come together in this search. You and Shimon Peres, your foreign minister, uh, you have shaken hands with Chairman Arafat. Do you, despite all, despite the actions of, of the extremists on both sides, do you believe it's going to happen? That you're going to have peace? There is a famous saying in Israel that I use from time to time. In accordance to the Bible, all the prophets came from that region. Today, it's not advisable to become a prophet what will happen there. Therefore, I would say, I'll do my best. I'll do my utmost to achieve it. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. It's great to have you here on a what has been a very long day for you, and I thank you for coming by, and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank Great you. to see you. Thank you. We'll be right back. We'll talk more about what's happening to the Peace Accord with uh, three very distinguished observers of the scene in Israel and in the Middle East back after this break. Stay with us. <laughs>